Hello, everyone. We have a lot of people here who want to play a game today. Wonderful. I'll wait till I get everyone in to make my <clears throat> disclaimer announcements. Hi. Hello. My name's Kalite. I see that. Although I wouldn't have pronounced it correctly. Thank you. <laughs> That's why I say that. <laughs> Um, let's see. This is my first session. Oh my Bonjour. gosh. Bonjour, Peter Le <laughs> Oh my gosh, you're one of those guys. <laughs> Thank you. I wish I could speak French. I'll say uh, très bien, merci, but oh uh, you speak good French. <laughs> oh, right, right. You, you, it's exhausted. I can't say anything more. Un petit pas, how's that? Oh oui. <laughs> I uh, want to tell you folks, when we start the game, the game only allows a certain number of participants, and we've got a large number of people here. Mm -hmm. Some of you, the ones who log in a little bit later, may get not allowed into the game. Don't worry about that, because what's going to happen, even though you won't be able to play. Martin, can you just, or whoever's can everyone mute themselves? That was just going to make this go a little bit easier. So if everyone please mute themselves. If you don't, I will mute you. Nothing personal. So what I'm saying is when we start this game, some of you people may not be allowed into the game because it's full. Do not leave the game, okay? Because what will happen is I'll read the question out loud. You'll be able to see the question on the screen. On, on, my, on the screen of your computer, you'll see the options, put down what you think the right answer is, and then we'll come up with it and explain it. So even though you're not going to get points on the game, you can still be playing the game even if you're not admitted. First rule is, I don't care if your camera is on or not. Um, it, I probably am not going to be looking at you anyways, but I just want to know that's up to you. But absolutely, I want your microphones off. I just don't want to pick up the background noise. It's interrupting. Should you have a question about what we're doing, let's rely on the chat box. Just type in the question and I'll deal with it. Uh, because if, if we, with this many people, if everyone's turning their microphones on and talking at the same time, we're going to have more chaos than order, okay? So let's, let's keep our mics off, communicate through the chat box, and um, if you can't get into the game, please still play the game right on the screen, okay? If that makes sense, put a number one in the chat box. If it doesn't make sense, I don't want to hear it. But no, if it doesn't make sense, ask me to repeat it or something. Next order of business, I'm going to share my screen here. What you are looking at here should be, if you go on insurance exam queen, let's see, I'll scroll down. At the top, there's a, there's a command that says book your spot. I got three classes going on next week in um, PNC. You can book your spot for that class and we're running a special. If you feel you can benefit from all three classes, the classes are $27. You get two hours on the topic taught by me. And at the end of the day, you'll kind of know if that's going to be helpful or not by listening to me. If you want all three, you can have all three for $60. Okay. So it's kind of like the home shopping network. We get, we got deals every day. This is what we're doing today, but you can book your spot by just going on the website, say book your spot. Uh, let's see, what questions should we have? Let me, you don't want to see that. Don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. Anybody ever see the Wizard of Oz? Just don't pay attention. Um, let me get where I want to be.
All right, got that part fixed. Um, that still doesn't have me where I want to be. Oh, I know what I'm doing. You know, it doesn't look like it. I know what I'm doing. But I think I do. Can you guys see Kahoot duplicate of P and C series? Is that visible to you? Just a number one helps me. Okay, I haven't gotten the pin yet. Notice it says up to 20 players. We got like 35 people here. I have gotten more than 20 in, but that's really up to the great computer programmers and not me. Let me uh, launch this thing and then we'll get the pin number. Here we go. Pin number is 707029. I only have, um, it looks like 13 people that have signed in yet, so there's room in the store. That's okay, Rita, that's fine. Now, if you can't hear me or the slides aren't working right, you guys make sure to put that in the chat. Okay, I'm showing 15, 16 people playing the game. Um, there's 37 participants so i'll wait a little bit more like i said not everyone has to play the game on their phone you can play it on your screen the other thing is if i start the game you can join the game in process all you need to go is go to kahoot.it and then put in the code of 700 7029 and that will appear on the screens as we're playing the game, if you didn't write it down. 700 7029, I just put that in the chat. So I'm up to 20 people and I want to launch the game so we can get started. Um, hopefully I'm not eliminating any of you people and you're all ready to play the game. So let me get started. All right. Kahoot at home. Forget the duplicate thing. I was making some changes. Forgot to change the name. Number one, first question. Buildings construction constructed with masonry and or other materials with fire resistant ratings of two hours or more. And the answer to that is it's fire resistive. In looking at the results, mostly everyone got that right. I don't really have an explanation as to why something is called something, but it said it's uh, masonry with a rating of two hours or more. So 
it's not non-combustible because it can it can go on fire after a while. It's not masonry combustible because it's just not what we call it. It's certainly not frame. The word that's used is fire resistive. Folks, when you're taking the test, you want to always bet on the words you've seen and studied over a word that may not have been in the book. You would find fire resistive in your studies, and that's why we go with it. Now, what happens right now is we see a scoreboard. After one question, the scoreboard is kind of unimportant. So we will not give credit to all you great people who got it right, but because it's only one question, we're going to move on to the next question, which is printed addendums to a contract. Correct that answer is it is a an an a endorsement. Most of you people got that right. Some people thought it could be supplementary coverage. Supplementary coverage always comes with a price. It's like adding sausage to your pizza. It doesn't come with it. And if you want it, you can have it, but you pay more. An endorsement is just put on the policy. Usually it favors the insured and it doesn't raise the cost. Warranty has nothing to do with this question. Neither does excluded. It's common on the test. They will give you a couple of bogus answers, which don't make any sense at all. Just take them off the page and, and try to choose among the others. What I wanna do along with explaining the question and the answer is continually give you some test tips, little things to look at when you're taking the test. So the next, oh, let's let's give some credit here. Um, I got to move some things on my screen. I can't read everything because I got the chat box on my screen. I got the list of people. If there's someone that needs to be let in, oh, it's so confusing to run this. <laughs> I can't drive this bus anyway. That's my problem. Sue with a line crossed through it, then insurance, is it insurance queen, king? Insurance king. Oh, you're married to Melissa. I got it. Uh, Arizona Susie, Bree, and, oh, you told me your name. Did you say it's Kilite? Told me how to say it, and I forgot it already. Um. My screen is not showing the options on the color square. Gosh, Jesus, that's an IT problem and I'm not an IT guy. I'm not sure how that gets fixed. I'm sorry. Next question. Lists of duties and rules of both parties. That is conditions. Folks, what you're looking at with this question is a common question on your test. What they're really saying is, where do you find this in your policy? The policy is divided into certain sections. Three of those sections appear among the answers. There's declarations, insuring clause, and conditions. Temporary agreement of insurance has got nothing to do, is nothing in your policy that says that. Temporary agreement of insurance is not one of the sections of your policy. Each of these sections houses some specific information. Declarations tells us the basics of the policy. Who's covered? Who's the insurance company? What do you pay? What are you covered for? Basically four fundamental things and that's it. You will not find in declaration any lists of duties, okay? The insuring clause, I've described this, if anybody's in, been in my past classes, I'd love to repeat myself. 
the insuring clause is the engine in the car. If you don't have an insuring clause, you don't have a policy, just like I don't really have a car because I can't drive it. The insuring clause set is the insurance company make a promise to pay the claim. They do that in the insuring clause. If the insurance company is not promising to pay a claim, you don't have a policy. So it's it's the engine in, in the motor of the policy. Conditions are exactly what it says above. It tells you what the duties and rules are for the, the insured duh and the insurer, insurance company, and the client. All their duties and rules are listed in conditions. And you're going to need to know these sections. You know, there's more sections than that, but they're going to give them to you. They're going to have endorsements. They're going to have supplementary coverage. And you got to know what goes in each of them. This is, I have a, a different kind of way of looking at things and I, you don't have to think like me, but to me, this is a matching question. Which of the, of the parts of the policy match what it says at the above? The list duties and rules of both questions. And after that one, let's see what happened. Sue moved into the lead. We don't cross her name out anymore. Bree, Insurance King, Arizona Susie, and Galite. I'm going to say that over and over again. Galite. Next. Let's smoke and drink because someday we're going to die. What type of hazard is that person? That's good, T. Just put down and think it is. It is a morale hazard, blue. We find that people get confused between moral and morale, but that's not you guys. This class seems to have figured that out. The simple solution is to write one word. Moral is dishonest person. Morale is uh, careless. And this clearly is a careless person. They're not gonna be careful about what they're doing. So those two words look the same. There's a one letter difference. One is um, dishonest and the other is careless, but you guys appear to already know that. So with that, let's see how our scoreboard may have changed. Bree is in first, Arizona Susie, sat third, Insurance King in Syria, new, new number five. That's our standings after only a couple of questions, four questions. The next question says, the maximum limit of coverage available under a liability policy during a policy, regardless of the number of claims. an aggregate limit. And again, most of you got it right. I do understand you people thinking it was limits of liability because it sure sounds like limits of liability. Um, I'm going to just describe an aggregate policy because it's really an unusual policy. An aggregate policy has, yes, it has a maximum limit, but that limit is for the whole year. So each claim reduces that limit down. Where a split limit or a single limit policy, that max limit of liability is per claim. Once, if you have a second claim, it has the full amount of coverage as the first claim. But in an aggregate policy, it does not. So it's all you get regardless of how many claims you get. If you have 500,000, that's all you get for the whole year. Even if you have multiple claims, once you have pay a claim, it doesn't go back to 500,000. It keeps going down and down and down. So it doesn't matter the number of claims, that's all you're gonna be covered for is the aggregate limit. I hope my explanations 
are making some sense because just to take the test, it's fun, but it would be nice to know why, or if there's something I need a little more knowledge on, hopefully my explanation is helping. That's why we do these things. Okay, Arizona Susie and Sue, well, Bree is first. Arizona Susie, Sue, Danny, and Siri are our top five people. The next question says, provides for the sharing of the lost with other insurance that may be written on the same risk. Okay, that is pro rata. A lot of you thought it was excess. Let me, let me try. That's why I'm here. Try to explain what the difference is. We use pro rata when we have more than one policy on the same risk. So I have, I'll make a simple example, a half a million dollar house. I buy 300,000 with one company, 200,000 with another. So how do we share the loss? And the answer would be pro rata. Let me continue on pro rata for a second because it's Latin. Most people don't speak Latin. This is Peter Lemieux's breakdown of pro rata. Fair share. Each company pays their fair share. So if the two companies had 250 and 250, the claim would be paid, each of them pay half the claim. But if it's 300 and 200,000, that 300,000 has to pay 60% of the claim. Is that right? And the 200,000 has to pay 40% of the claim. They pay their fair share. Whatever percentage of the risk they take is the percentage of the claim that they pay. And I just call that fair. Okay. Pro rata is a fair share. Excess is different. If it's excess, what would happen is you would have a structure that says first policy pays up to their limit. Second policy pays anything that goes over the first policy limit. So in an excess carrier would only have to pay what the first company couldn't pay. Okay, it's above and beyond the first company, which is why we call it excess. And that is not what the question was. It says sharing of loss. In excess, you don't share the loss. The first company pays everything. The second company picks up the, the stuff that first company didn't pay. But in sharing the loss, it has to be pro rata. Now, did anybody, when they read this question, think of the word reinsurance? and need an explanation as I know, other than the fact it wasn't a choice, why wasn't this reinsurance? Do we wanna go there? Is that a room you don't wanna go in? Yes. Now well, a couple of people. First question, with a Y or an N, have you heard about reinsurance? Yes or no? The ones answering are saying yes. What re and no, it's okay. The, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. I'm going to get the same explanation anyways. I just kind of wanted to know. Reinsurance is an insurance company. If By the way, you can go back and watch this again. Melissa is going to post it if you want to see it again. But if you don't want to watch the whole video, be smart. Get a pen in your hand and write little love notes to yourself about what we're talking about. Reinsurance, it happens when an insurance company insures an insurance company. That's different than what we're looking at here, where two people insure the same client. How does an insurance company insure an insurance company? Well, let's use an example of an insurance company gets a huge policy, and it's a $1 billion structure, business, whatever. That's a lot of money, okay? Well, the client has to pay a lot of money. 
And if they pay that money, the insurance company is going to pay that claim. But their concern isn't that they can't pay the claim. They just rather not pay all of that money on one claim. So what they do is they get a reinsurer to back them up. So imagine that I'm a company and Lynn, you're a company. I got this billion dollar policy. I really don't want to pay that all in one claim. And I say to Lynn, Lynn, will you take 40% of this? So if we have a claim, you pay 400 million and I pay 600 million and I'll give you your fair portion of the premium to, so that you can cover it. It's just, we won't have to pay out one big number. We kind of split it up. You get paid a fair amount. I get paid a fair amount. The, the, the thing about reinsurance is the client never sees that. I bought my insurance from Peter Lemieux company. I pay premiums to Peter Lemieux company. And when I have a claim, Peter Lemieux company pays the claim. What they don't see is behind the scenes, I'm giving some of that payment to Lynn's company. Lynn's taking a risk. When a claim comes in, I pay, I don't remember the proportion now, 60% of the claim and Lynn pays 40%. So it's when we help each other out, but it's behind the scenes. The client never sees it. That's not what this question is about. This is sharing the loss, but it's evident because there's two separate policies. That's what the example here is. If it had said an insurance company is sharing, no, I wouldn't use sharing. An insurance company is using another insurance company to back them up. That would be reinsurance, but um, it may be a subtle difference, but that's why I said this kind of sounds like reinsurance. The difference here is that there's two policies. The client actually bought two policies. In our example of reinsurance, the client buys one policy. Okay. Was that helpful? You know, when I was a little boy, my father told me, if you put enough dirt into a clear stream, you will eventually make mud. And I er always worry when I go in a lengthy explanation that I'm not helping, but I'm making mud. So at least I help two or three people. That's my goal. No, I'm really, my goal is to help all you people. Next one, scoreboard. Let's see. Arizona Susie, Bree, Danny, Sue, and B, P, and C. Whoever you all are. That's where we stand after only six questions. It is not uncommon that I don't get all the questions done because I'm so intent on the purpose of this is to teach, not to just give you a quiz. If you just want to take a quiz, you can take quizzes anywhere on the internet. Next one says here, reduces recovery to an injured person if a blank... Yeah, I can't read the question. Interrupted the chain of events. Reduces cover recovery to an injured person if something interrupts the chain. That's a hard question. Uh, let's see, 10, 14, 17 of you tried to answer it. You should all try. I mean, no one's going to kick you out of class if you miss a question, right? The answer is an intervening cause. Well, here is um, something I've always said about our class. The hardest thing about an insurance test is the language they use because it's really a foreign language. We don't speak like this. So I would say this. I would write the words down intervening clause just something you should certainly know by the time you take the test. It reduces recovery to an injured person. This intervening claw cause interrupts the chain of events. I just made a video before I came on here and I talked about something called proximate cause. So is anybody, did I, I'm talking to you guys about that, right? So, so um, the, the definite, and again, I have a reason for going off the question. I'm trying to put this in some sort of a box that makes sense, okay? 
Proximate cause is part of your test and they have an excellent example in most of the study books. You have a, a fire policy, your building catches fire, the firemen came out, drench it in water. You go out and you have a significant amount of water damage, but your coverage doesn't cover water damage. You have no problem there because the proximate cause, like the original cause, was the fire. You would have had no water damage if it wasn't for the fire. So because it started with coverage, fire coverage, it, it, it's an unbroken chain. But here we have a chain, but it is broken because there was an intervening clause between the original cause of the loss and the loss. There's an intervening cause that came in and that reduces how much you can recover. So again, it's I, I don't know how to sp explain words and definitions other than to just tell you what I think it is. If I'm not making sense, do yourselves a favor, write down intervening cause and look it up. Write down proximate cause and look it up, even though that's not in there. If you can't find it in your books, Google it. You'll get excellent description and examples. It's not an assumption of the risk. An assumption of the risk would mean I, the client, assume the risk, not the insurance company. That's not what's going on here. Comparative negligence would happen when two people are to blame and both are negligent. That's not really what it describes here. It's not doesn't describe contributory negligence either. I'm going to say something really silly, I think. If you had never known a thing about insurance, but if you understood the English language well enough, there's only one answer here that fits in that sentence. Something intervened. An, inter an injured person intervenes the chain. It's not assumed, it's not comparative, it's not contributory. So if it got intervening in there, that's the, the word. There's a lot of ways to get a question right on the test other than just knowing the information of insurance. I'm not telling you not to study, but the more relaxed you are when you take your test, and sometimes you might have to think out of the box, what word would interrupt? I think an intervention would interrupt. You would be the right answer. So along with teaching you about what these words mean, I'm trying to teach you some little tricks you can use to help find the right answer. The next question is, I mean, Arizona Susie, Danny, Bree, Wendy, and Sue are our top players. Let's see what we got for the next question. The next question says the maximum amount available for payment of bodily injury to a single person in an accident. For occurrence, I'll let you guys read that. The answer is per person. Most of you got it right. There is a temptation to go with a limit of liability. I understand that. But what's the question say? Maximum amount. Well, that's a limit. I, I understand that. Available for payment of bodily injury to a single person. That makes it per person, which goes back to another little test taking dip I like. Oftentimes, the answer is written into the question. If you can read the question accurately. So folks, to pass your test, make a commitment. I won't put an answer down until I've read the question two times. And I asked myself, what are they asking for? Okay. So when you do that, you can, are there clues in the question? Like that intervening cause? Are there clues in the question that will point me to the right answer? It says to a single person, big clue. So to all you detectives out there who like to solve mysteries, pretend some of the questions are mysteries and you look for the clue. Now, what does that do for our leaderboard? Danny, 
first place, Bree, Su Arizona, Susie, Sue, Wendy, et cetera, et cetera. Next question. Lying on purpose. <laughs> what do we call that? It's a moral hazard. Well, first of all, from the chapter that this is in, there is no lying hazard. There's only three hazards, physical, moral, and morale. Morals is a dishonest person. Morale is a careless person. It seems to me that lying in purpose is a clearly dishonest person. Fits right into the mor moral hazard. So. Do I have to know the stuff to pass the test? Sure. You know what this question's about? The difference between moral and morale. So one is dishonest and one is careless. Surely by the time your state exam, you can get those two clear in your mind. So when you walk in for the most important two hours of your life that day, that is not a question in your mind. You got that settled. Let's see if our leaderboard changed. I don't think it did. Looks like we have the same people, just different lists. Let's see, it says that somebody named Lynn is the highest climber, moving up five places. We only show the top five. Next one says, if I can read it, failure to do what a reasonable and prudent person would have done in the same or similar circumstance. Failure to do what a reasonable and prudent person that's negligence <laughs> that's a first one that everyone got totally right and I was going to tell you about, I made a video explaining that you guys don't need to watch it because you all got it. It is negligence, failing to do what a reasonable and prudent uh, person would do. But just for an explanation, what's the definition of the word peril? What is a peril? Thank you. It is actually the cause of the loss. And that's important because if it's not, as you guys know, you're studying this course. If your policy doesn't cover that peril, they're not paying for it. It's the, that which causes the loss. Very important word in insurance. There's another word there that comes up all the time and it makes no sense to the common American, indemnity. What is that? Four syllables? It's what the heck is an indemnity? Let me try. Thank you, Martin. Martin's going to teach this class because he's got it right. Or it could be Martin. You never know. Excuse me. Indemnity restores you to where you were, but it doesn't make it more profitable for you. It's the fundamental core of what insurance is about. And the simplest example I have, you're sitting here driving a 2017 Toyota Corolla, nice car, it gets totaled. Your insurance company is not going to give you enough money to go and buy a Ferrari. Why? Indemnity. We're going to put you back where you were, but we're not going to make life better. We're going to get for you the blue book value, whatever, the value of your 2017 Corolla. So you can go out and get a used Corolla and you're back where you started. That's the principle of indemnity, restoring you, which Martin or Martine did not need to know, but I'm going to say it anyways. 
Looks to me like our leaders are practically the same. I want to give credit to D for getting three in a row correct. And we move on to the next question. A property insurance policy that covers a certain kind or unit of property for a set amount of insurance. And that is a specific, again, clues all over the board in the question that covers a certain kind of property for a set amount, a set amount of insurance. That would be specific. Now, it could be simple. It could be certain, except you want to know something? I don't think those policies appear in your study material. Okay. Blanket is an actual kind of insurance, but it isn't set amount of insurance. Well, it is, but it covers many things. Set amount and the word specific go together. They, they just remember I told you about clues. There's a huge clue in this question that gets you settled the right way. Does somebody have a question? I hear a microphone on. So check your microphones. If yours is on, you don't have a question, please turn it off. Um, otherwise, we're going to hear your dogs barking and your kids crying and everything like that. Or I'll just turn it off for you. Don't take it personal. Next question. Well, before I go there, it looks to me like the leaderboard is staying identically the same, which probably means all of our leaders are getting the questions right. Solomon. Three in a row. Let's give some credit out there. Next question. It says here, staying at a hotel after a, f a f that's supposed to be fire. It's not first. What is staying in a, ho in a hotel? Perfect. It's an indirect loss. So that means we've got to revisit this direct and indirect loss, okay? And the I'm going to use the example, then you guys maybe be able to figure it out. You own a house and you get rental income from the house. The house burns down, the renters leave, okay? The house is a direct loss. That's what I insured. That money that I lost is an economic loss that's indirect. So here we have, you're staying in your house. It's so damaged that you have got you can't live there. So you got to go and stay in a hotel. That's a loss of money. I'm going to have to pay the hotel. So that becomes an indirect loss. Do we cover indirect losses? Of course, but we have to know the difference between a direct and an indirect loss. Uh, the indirect loss is going to cost you money. We insured the house. Staying in a hotel is not part of the house, but it's still a loss. Hopefully, if you think about it in the loss of money, we actually have a name for that coverage. Anybody know what we call that kind of coverage? It has cool initials if you're a drinker. Additional living expense. I taught a class in Colorado a year after they had these huge fires. I actually had two students in the class whose houses were so damaged they had to go live in a hotel. But they had on their homeowner's policy additional living expenses. Clue, all homeowner's policies have that coverage. But when you study the policies, you'll see that. Are we okay? We still friends? You know, I like to be helping you people with explanations that help make sense of this. All way. we have a change in the leaderboard. I think, let's see, Danny, Sue, Arizona, Susie, Wendy, and Bree are now the top five. Casey, three in a row. Congratulations, Casey. Next question. Physical damage to either people or property. 
That is direct loss. And only three out of uh, like 20 of you, right? 25 of you, only three got it right. Most of you thought it was physical damage. Well, it says in the question, physical damage to either people or property. Physical damage is going to be to property. So this misses the mark because it says people also. So people get hurt and the property get hurt. That is a direct loss. You ensure that, okay? It's not an indirect loss. It's what you buy the insurance for. And I think the big question is why isn't it physical damage? Physical damage is Well, I don't know if I can answer that really clearly to you people. Physical damage is to the property, but I don't see physical damage as a fair explanation of the people who got hurt. And that's my attempt at answering that question. So let's imagine you're taking a practice quiz and you get this question and like Peter, you're not quite sure why, what's wrong with 14? My suggestion on how to handle that is look up physical damage, look up the definition of it, look up direct loss, and that should help you. If it doesn't help you, just kind of file it that direct loss is to both people and property, and then don't worry about it, okay? You know that the questions we ask, especially on a Kahoot game, are not going to be on the test. These are not test questions. This is a game. The information will be on the test, but asked in a different way. Okay, Kalite says, I believe physical is damage to the physical body. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, I think physical damage is to the property. Look it up. If, if I'm wrong, you know what? I skill is helping people learn enough to pass the test. I have never once got a hundred on a test. I'm not here because I know a hundred percent of everything. But obviously, people know that having been with me for almost an hour. We just try to make sense of it. Yeah, bodily injury is people for sure. That absolutely is bodily injury. I'm going to say this is a tough question to explain, but I don't think you should lose one minute of sleep over. I would look up physical damage. I would look up direct loss, get the best out of it and move on. That's the way I would handle a question like this. Uh, let's see. Leaderboard did change. I see Bree moved up into third place for sure. Solomon is the highest climber having advanced five places. Next question is a transfer of legal rights and ownership of the policy. What do we call that? The answer to that question is an assignment. You know, I think when we all know what it means to give rights of the policy to someone else, it's just giving your policy to somebody else. Um, but there's a word for it. We assign it. So when we assign it, all the rights of ownership go to that person. Okay. It's not an appraisal. It's got nothing to do with it. Arbitration's got nothing to do with it. It doesn't even come close uh, to explaining indemnity. Appraisal and arbitration occur when you and the insurance company don't agree on how much the claim should be for. You want X, the insurance company wants to pay you X minus. They don't want to pay you what you think you should. And you're arguing with the insurance company. 
if it is a property claim, finding out what the property is worth, that would be an appraisal. You both get an appraiser to figure out what the property is worth. But if it is about a liability claim, pain and suffering, okay? There's no appraiser can tell you how much pain and suffering someone has. So when you have an, an argument or your insurance company and the victim has an argument about the worth, arbitration would be a way to settle that. That's for liability claims. Appraisal for property and, and arbitration for casualty or liability. Just, a, just a, a word, rather than just getting the question, let's try to understand everything that you throw at us to the best we can, okay? Uh, let's see. It looks to me like we had a change in leadership. I think Arizona Susie moved up. Jordan, I think, is a new person on the list. Says here that Kira has moved up three places. Let's move on to the next question. You guys are doing great. Sometimes people say, my brain's getting fried. I need a break. <laughs> you guys are sitting at home. Take a break. Stand up. Go get a glass of water uh, and don't do a question. But uh, no, I'm not going to give breaks. We're going to move ahead. I might pass out from lack of liquid, but if that happens, that's my problem. Let's see. A material or structural issue that increases the chances of a loss. That's a physical hazard. This is a really simple question. They just try to trick you with the question. This is a question about a hazard. If it increases the chance of a loss, that's the definition of a hazard. So they don't put hazard in the question. They give you the definition of hazard. Only on your test, they'll spell increase correctly. <laughs> this one isn't. But anything that increases the possibility or chance of a loss is a hazard. We know there's only three hazards, okay? Fire is not one of them. It's either physical, moral, or morale. And the question says it is a material or structural issue. So it's not about dishonesty. It's not about carelessness. It's physical. So it's, it's a, well, look at me. Talk about wasting your time. I didn't notice every one of you got it right. This is supposed to be a, an instructor's mic drop, right? I've taught this class perfectly because you got them all right. <laughs> Uh, so sorry to preach at something you already know, but I do stand by this. Sometimes the question is much simpler than it sounds. This is which is a structural issue is which hazard. But instead of telling you that way, they give you the definition of hazard just to see how knowledgeable you are. That is a technique that they definitely will use to understand if how deep your knowledge is. Uh, what do we do to the leaderboard? I see Bree moved up from fifth to fourth. Lynn, God bless, Lynn has what, gotten eight in a row correct. Um, Susie, um, no, I think that comment on the chat we already dealt with. I, next question, what is a physical hazard? Well, we're on hazard questions here. Physical hazard is structural and material. It's actually a repeat of the prior question. And you guys all got that one right. So you're definitely going to get this one right, right? So I'm not going to talk about the three hazards anymore. You've heard enough of that. We will see here that the leaderboard stayed exactly the same. Number 11 question, is this correct? It says, the amount of money realized from the sale of damaged merchandise. It's an amount of money.
that is salvage. So your car gets totaled, the insurance company pays you, the insurance company now owns that piece of metal. It's salvage. Well, the salvage is what they can get when they sell it. It's the money they get. So the salvage might be worth only two or three thousand dollars, but that's what we call salvage. It's the money you get from selling damaged merchandise. Um, hopefully that helps. But I want to alert you for your test. There are four words here that absolutely can and show up on a lot of tests. You got to know what salvage is. You got to know what subrogation is. You got to know abandonment and liberalization. If you don't know what those words are, you are vulnerable to lose a point on the test. Um, I'm not going to right now explain each of those words because they may come up in a future question. But if they don't, please do yourself a favor. Write them down and make sure before you go into state exam, you know what subrogation is. You know abandonment, you know salvage, and you know liberalization. Taking enough quizzes and tests that all of those frequently show up on the test. So just an alert. Look at if it's that easy to score four points on this test, take it. All right, just take the points. That's now you only need 66 more to get your 70, right? So I'm not guaranteeing all four of these will be on your test, but they frequently show up. I'll tell you that. Moving on. Let's see, the scoreboard did, we did have a shift in the scoreboard. Um, Sue is first, Arizona Susie is second. It's a day for Sue's. What can I tell you? Danny, Bree, and Jordan are the next three on the list. Steph is back with three in a row. And the next question says, contains the insurer's promise to pay. Probably don't remember this, but I already told you what this is. That is the insuring clause. Just to remind you what I said, although this explanation will never be on the test, I called it the engine to the car. You don't have insurance unless you have an insurance cl insuring clause, which is the insurance company's promise to pay. Then it goes on. We will pay if the loss is caused from these perils. But the insurance co uh, insuring clause is a promise to pay. Let's see, I did see, there's some shift in the top five here. Uh, Sue dropped, I think from second to fifth. Bree, Danny, and Jordan are third, second, third, and fourth. Arizona Susie still in first place. Um, tough round, three players lost their answer streak at three. Next one. The individual whose name appears on the policy's declaration. And the answer to that question is a named insured. Peter, why isn't it first named insured? It could be. It could be the first named insured, I'll agree. But if you were tempted to go with blue, what you did is you put a word into the question that is not there. The question never says first. All it says name appears. If the name appears, you are a named insured. And if you thought it was first named insured, you thought it said first, but it didn't. The reason I point that out to you is a lot of people miss questions. When we look back on it, what we found out is they, in their brain, changed what the question says to meet the answer they wanted it to be. Don't ever let yourself do that. 
take only what the question says and don't say, oh, they must mean first. No. What it says is what it says and answer it. Okay. Be very legalistic about that. I can't tell you how many people we've worked with who know the information, but they want it to be a certain answer. So in their brain, they change the question. Don't ever let yourself do that. Okay. Just helpful tip. All right. Scoreboard. We got some shifts here. Siri is in first place. Where did Siri come from? Arizona, Susie, Jordan, Bree, and Danny. I haven't told you guys how you score, although you may already know. In a Kahoot, you get points for two reasons. Obviously, you get no points if you miss the question. But getting the question right will give you points. The next thing is, the faster you answer it, you get a few more points. So if Jordan and Bree get a question right. The one who answered first gets a few more points than the other. <clears throat> one of the bad things about a Kahoot is we're training you to answer fast so you can win the game. You get no credit for doing that in the state exam. In fact, in the state exam, it's the exact opposite of what I want you to do. I do not want you to answer questions fast on the state exam. I want you to really understand the question consider all the answers and pick what clearly to you is the right answer. So just a little bit of uncle Peter told me to do this. Why? Because he loves us. An insured structure in which no people have been living or working and no property has been stored. Empty is not an answer. And the answer is vacant. 23 out of 25 got that right. No people, no stuff for 60 days. That's vacant. Two people thought unoccupancy. Unoccupancy is no people, but there's stuff in there. It's all your furniture's there and you will be returning. That's unoccupancy. But vacant says that building is empty for 60 days. A fundamental difference that you have to know clearly. Why? Because if you get a question on this, it's so daggum easy. You don't want to be missing easy questions. If you got to get 70 points and they give you, say, seven easy ones, you want to go seven for seven on the easy ones. Okay? That, that's just your Uncle Peter giving you some friendly advice. Let's see what happens. Scoreboard stayed exactly the same. Let's take another question. And the question is, all the following are duties after a loss, except, except question. Okay, making cash payments. Almost all of you got it right. Let's let's look. Anytime you get an accept question, the word accept will be in caps. So you shouldn't miss that it's an accept question. But in this case, an accept question means three answers are right. One is not right. So when you see a right answer, whoa, be careful because there are three right ones. Call the police if there's a theft. Absolutely, we would be expected to do that. Prepare an inventory. You can't get the insurance company to pay you a claim without you telling them what you lost. So that makes sense. Protect from further damage. Absolutely. Your house um, had, had fire damage. There's some windows out. Board them up. Board them up so not no, you don't get people breaking in and doing additional damage. Protect it. What you can't do is make cash payments to those who hurt you. I said that wrong. You wouldn't do that to those who you hurt. What's wrong with that? Well, if you both agree to it and you don't want to involve the insurance company, that might work. 
but I don't like it because you do that. There's nothing in the world that would stop that person from turning around and still suing you. There's no legal agreement, no signed acceptance that this is full payment. And once you've done that, the insurance company's not coming in. It'll say clearly under conditions, don't ever do that. Now, here's encouraging news, folks. <clears throat> if we ask you about conditions after a loss, I don't think I'm wrong. Every time I've seen what are your duties after a loss, this is the question. And the answer is always don't make payments, don't accept payments. And I mean, for me, 100% of the time, if it's an accept question, that's one of the answers and it would be correct. Whether you get that or not, I don't know, but don't be making payments or accepting payments. That is not going to be found in your policy. Every time I get an accept question, this is going to sound really stupid. So just understand, I had this old dude teaching me and he said dumb things, okay? When my kids were little, they watched a TV show called Sesame Street. I'll never forget this. I guess I watched a lot of Sesame Street. And they sang a song that said, one of these things just doesn't belong here. One of these things is not the same. An accept question is exactly that same Sesame Street question. One of these questions does not belong in this group. You're looking at three chickens and a duck. So sometimes on an accept question, it's as simple as that. There are three things that seem to be about something specific and another one's got nothing to do with it. That is probably the one that doesn't belong. Again, just little extra tips. When you get a question, you say, I don't know the answer to this. Look for other ways to find the right answer. But this one's simple, no cash. Uh, let's see, we got a shift in the leaderboard. Arizona Susie Jordan, Siri Bree Danny, and Phoenix Z is making a comeback with three in a row. We're doing okay, right? We're having the fun of this game. That's what you came in here for. Just play a little game and learn something along the way. Single property policy covering multiple classes. It's a blanket policy and almost everyone got it right. Here's an easy way to remember blanket policy. Picture a blanket and uh, mom's coming to the apartment and or the house and there's just some clutter. And you don't want mom seeing the clutter because she does, she's gonna start getting on your back about why don't you clean up? So you take a blanket and you cover it. She doesn't even see it, right? Blanket covers many things. And that's what the question was, covering multiple classes. The way to cover multiple things with one policy is put a blanket over it. Now, the other explanation I have makes no sense. Do you guys know Michael Jackson actually named one of his kids blanket? Well, that's a side. That's got nothing to do with it. What's the difference between an umbrella and a blanket? Thank you, Arizona Susie. Susie, do you know I'm in Arizona? We, we could be across the street from each other as we talk. Isn't that crazy? An umbrella policy is a liability policy. It's a specific insurance policy. You might take out your rusty, dusty pen. Umbrella is a liability policy that covers your negligence. And it, it goes above the coverage you have. It's extra coverage. Okay. So um, I have on my homeowner's policy, a hundred thousand dollars of liability. That's not a whole bunch of money. So I might buy an umbrella policy that goes above my hundred thousand. We pay up to a hundred thousand, but if it claims for 200,000, my umbrella picks up the extra, the excess. 
but umbrella is a liability policy, okay? What we're talking about here is a property policy, single property policy. You guys are taking a course on property and casualty. Property is your stuff. Casualty is injuries you do to others. So we get that all clear in our minds. Sometimes things fall into place. What happened here? Ah, I see more changes. You guys are competing well. Jordan into first, series second. Arizona Susie, a West Sider. My son's a West Sider. I'm not. Bree and Danny. Can I repeat it again? Kira, are you serious? I don't even remember what I had for lunch and you want me to repeat. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Casualty and property. Property is stuff. It's the building. It's the she shed in the back, right? It's your TV set. It's your computers. It's your stuff. Casualty is somebody else that suffers a loss because of you. You were negligent. They, they got hurt. They got lost. Your dog bit them and they had to go to urgent care. That's liability. That's on you but it's not property loss, okay? Casualty, like casualties, death, et cetera. Ooh, that's the extreme, but yeah. But but you have to be responsible for it. I mean, if my next door neighbor drops dead of a heart attack, that's not my fault, right? They have to be able to prove that it was your fault for it become a casualty claim. So you, you insure your stuff, but you also have liability. Do you know... A renter's policy, even though you're not insuring the building, comes with liability. It's your contents and liability. However, we did study a policy. Excuse me for going off, but I think it's helpful to remind you. There is a policy that we sell that does not come with liability. Does anyone remember what that policy is called? Somebody does. This is a bright class. Don't be shy. Thank you very much, Phoenix. It's a dwelling policy. Dwelling policy one, two, and three do not come with liability. You can add it, but it doesn't come with it. All your homeowners come with liability. That is protecting you from a lawsuit when you screw up, either purposely or, well, purposely is a problem, but usually it's, I didn't mean this to happen, but it still happened forgot to shovel the snow and the guy broke his arm. Well, that's on you. Do you want to pay his $10,000 hospital bill or do you want your liability insurance to step in and pay it for you? Easy answer. Next question. Protects the interest of the mortgage company. Who cares about them? That is mortgagee limits. Am I right? No, I'm wrong. I'm looking at boxes and colors and not engaging my brain. It's mortgage rights. Well, I understand why you'd get mixed up. Mortgagee, mortgagee, mortgage are three of the questions. Lost settlements, probably not it. <clears throat> what mortgage, well, let's read the question. See if that helps us find the right answer. It says here, protects the insurance interest of the mortgage company. Well, what's it's not limits. That limits how much we pay. It is the rights. The mortgage company has rights. That would be their interest. This is, again, more of a question of English than it is insurance. What does the word interest mean? The mortgage company owns part of your house. If you have a $200,000 mortgage and your house is insured for $300,000, the mortgage company owns two-thirds of your house. They got $200,000 invested in your house. So if that burns down to the ground, what rights do they have? What's their interest? Their interest is $200,000 in your house. So that would be covered by their rights not their limits. 
The limits is a different question. That's how much the insurance company you bought, how much insurance you bought. But their interest is covered by their rights. So not perhaps the best explanation, but it is an example that understanding the words of the insurance companies use makes the test a lot easier. If you folks would think that you're studying a foreign language, forget about insurance. I'm studying a foreign language. It's the language insurance people speak. And you learn the words, all the questions get easier. But if you don't learn the words, every question looks like Greek, no pun intended. But it looks like a foreign language, right? So spend time learning the words. If you don't know what a word means, look it up. Write it down. Once you write it down, study it and try to get that learned by the time your test comes up. Scoreboard, we did have a change. Sue moved into the third position. Siri has, oh my gosh, Siri, 12 in a row right. Siri, what state are you studying for? Everybody wants to study with you. 12 in a row is fantastic. Don't be shy. But I will move on to the next question. Incurred losses plus loss adjusting expense divided by earned premium. I'm already lost. Thank you, Siri, Illinois. That's a complex mathematical formula that only Albert Einstein can understand, right? No, not quite. That actually is your loss ratio. So let me translate this mathematical equation to English, okay? It's once you read these things slowly, it is not as complicated as it first sounds. Now, what we're talking about is from the view of the insurance company, okay? The insurance company has got losses, claims they have to pay. Plus, they've got an adjusting expense, the expense to figure out what the loss actually is. You know, there's people that do the investigations and things like that, but it's all the losses and the cost of settling them divided by the premium they receive. So if I pay out, I'll just use simple numbers, not insurance numbers. I pay out 80,000, but I took in 100,000. I have an 80% loss ratio. That means 80% of the money I take in goes out. It also means I got 20% profit. You know, folks, make it easy on yourself. Some of you already know this, just be patient with me. You do this every month when you do your budget. You look at what your bills were, what you spent. I shouldn't be just your bills, but what you spent. And you look at what came in the door. And if it's under 100%, you got some cushion. You actually got some room for savings, right? Savings, play, whatever you want. But what happens if you paid out 100 and took in 100? The insurance company made no money. All they did was break even. Worse, what if they pay 110 and took in 100? 110% means they're losing money. An insurance company can only lose money for so long before they go out of business. Just like you, if you spend more than you make, that game can only go on so long before you got serious problems, right? So you always want your loss ratio to be under 100%. You know, if you follow any financial people, Dave Ramsey or people like that, what do they tell you? Spend less than you make. So if your expenses at the top are lower than what you take in, it's under 100%, you're, you're, you're doing well. The lower it is, the more you make. So all we're doing here is we're taking what you guys actually do every month when you figure out your budget, and we're looking at it from an insurance company. What did I have to pay out? Losses and expenses. What did I take in? My premium. 
One over the other, I want it under 100%. I don't want to be paying 100% of what comes in. So that's all a loss ratio is, okay? Now, most of you know it because you, most of you got that question right. But sometimes when I'm working with people and mentoring them and stuff like that, I find they get freaked out by words or like this. This looks like, like I said, Albert Einstein mathematical equation. And your brain just rolls right off the bat. I don't get it. I'll never get it. I'm not good at math. Stop it. Just stop it. Think about it. It's very understandable. Are you spending less than you're making? That's the goal. Okay. Hopefully that explanation helps with that kind of scary formula. It's not scary. What do we do here? We got a new leader. Sue back in first place. Sue's quite the competitor. As soon as people go ahead of her, she's back in first place again. Uh, Jordan, 12 in a row, deserves certain recognition for that. The replacement cost method of loss valuation is defined as. Okay. Cost to buy brand new today. Now, you guys have been doing really good on this test, but not good on this question, okay? Most of you thought it was cost to buy brand new minus depreciation. Most of you picked that one. Only a couple of you picked the blue and the, what's that other one? Yellow, brown, I don't know what it is. I'm colorblind. Let's try to figure out what's wrong with cost to buy brand new minus depreciation, okay? Well, what's wrong with it is that's not replacement cost. That's the definition of actual cash value. Now, the two most important loss valuations, you can get, I think there's like five of them and you got to know all of them, but they always ask about replacement costs. They always ask about actual cash value. Replacement cost is we're just going to put brand new stuff in, whatever it costs. Even if it costs more than it's worth, we're going to give you a brand new one. If I had replacement costs on my 2015 Corolla, I would get a 2024 Corolla. They just give me a brand new one. That's replacement cost. Okay. Um, we do have replacement costs on homeowners policies, on a couple of the dwelling policies. And it's on the dwelling. And it, it, that's wonderful because if any of you have ever experienced a damage to your roof, if you don't have replacement costs, they're going to look at your roof and say, yeah, you, you need a new roof, but we're going to depreciate your roof because it's, it's 10 years old. You paid 10,000, but now it's 10 years old. It's only worth four. And you get a check for $4,000. That's a problem because I can't go and buy a used roof, correct? So it's good to have replacement cost on my dwelling. Not so hot on the car, right? I can buy a used car. So we have both actual cash value replacement cost possible. Replacement cost, all new stuff. We're just going to get you back. Replacement cost is going to take the cost of your product when it was new, but then we're going to depreciate it as it gets older. And we're going to give you the depreciated cost. It's Kelly blue book on a used car. Even though you bought it for 30 grand, it's only worth 18 today. That's actual cash value. Why? Because it takes in depreciation. ACV actual cash value uses depreciation. Replacement cost does not. It's just brand new roof, brand new car. Okay, so make sure you get those two clear. They're the most commonly asked. You've got to separate them. Then there's others you're going to have to learn. Functional replacement, uh, market value replacement, agreed, stated. 
you'll study those and get those. But the two they're going to go to school with, replacement costs and actual cash value. So make sure you get that straight in your mind. And I'm making a point of it because a lot of you miss that and I don't want you to miss it. Aren't I nice? Uncle Peter just wants us to pass. Arizona Susie, West Sider, she's at third place. By the way, Arizona Susie, the love of my life here, I have two grandsons who live out in a town called Verado near Buckeye. That's West Side. So anyway, it's got nothing to do with you guys. You know, you just say, hey, listen, I got this old teacher. Sometimes he talks about stuff and he doesn't make sense. So old people can do that, right? Thanks. Next one. Termination of a policy during its term. Well, almost everyone got it right. If you terminate a policy during its term, it's a cancellation. If you terminate it at its renewal or midterm ending, it's a non-renewal. But if it's, if I have a, my auto policy for some weird reason starts like March 15th and goes to March 14th of the next year. If during that year, I don't want the insurance or the insurance company doesn't want me, that's a cancellation. But if on March 14th, I tell them, I'm not going to renew with you, I'm going to another company, that's not a cancellation. That's just a non-renewal. Difference between non-renewal and cancellation is on your test. There is no such phrase as midterm ending. A loss settlement has got nothing to do with you canceling your policy. How do we settle up on a loss? Don't throw it away. It can't answer this question, okay? Hopefully, as we go through this, rather than just running through and say, I won the Kahoot game, we're using this to teach, which is why I run these games, to try to get a little bit of instruction going. Because in reality, what does it matter if you win a Kahoot game? No offense to you, Sue, or any of you people trying hard. What matters I pass that test, right? Lynn, three in a row. Let's go on to the next question. What's this one about? What type of policy will cover anything not excluded? Understand the wording. It covers anything not excluded. That is an open peril policy. Only one of you missed this. If you've been studying, you know that is exactly an open peril policy. It covers everything except exclusions. It, it could have been a specific policy, but it isn't. That's the definition of an open peril policy. In fact, this question should be a reminder to you that you understand the difference between open peril and named peril two different types of policy. You got to understand that going into the test. That's basic floor knowledge before you get into complicated stuff. Open and name peril. Name peril only covers the perils mentioned. Open peril covers all the perils except an exclusion. Example, dwelling policy one, if you've gotten to that part of the study, the lowest level of homeowners or dwelling policies, a DP1, with no extras on it. It's the cheese pizza with nothing on it, okay? Only has three perils. Fire, lightning, and internal explosion are all it covers. It's a named peril. When you get out to an open peril policy, it covers all the perils, except what's excluded, like you burning your own house down is excluded. Just a couple of examples that hope to understand that the language makes a little more sense because I was here today. Uh, Breeze in third place, Phoenix back three in a row. Next question. 
says here, a dollar amount an insured must pay on a claim before the insurance company provides coverage. And the answer to that is a deductible. My opinion is no one getting any kind of an insurance license. I should say this right. Everyone getting an insurance license should clearly understand what a deductible is. You pay first, then your insurance kicks in. They don't kick in until you pay or till you meet your deductible. And it clearly, most of you people got that down clear. It's, it's fundamental to understanding policies. If a policy has a deductible, you got to satisfy that before it kicks in. Okay. Next one. Well, let's see. I got a new second place person, Bree, Arizona, Susie, Jordan, Sarah, and Sue are our top five. And Wesley, Wellesley is back in the game with three in a row. Next question. Old English law that says the master is responsible for the servant. That is vicarious liability. And this is a reminder to you people, you got to know absolute, strict, and vicarious liability. They are 100% on your test. Now, when you know something's going to be on the test, and it only takes a little while to, for you to get it clear on your mind, if you don't get those points, that's really on you. Can you learn three levels of liability for two hours of your life? You betcha if it's important to you. And I'm telling you, don't skip these because they're on the test. Maybe you'll only get one of them, but it's on the test. So I'm going to review them top to bottom. Absolute liability is because of the nature of what you have or what you do. Two examples of absolute. You own a swimming pool. That's a liability. Okay. Just because you own a su swimming pool, that's an absolute liability. Here's another one. You paint houses, okay? And you're painting someone's house. Wind gust comes in, paint gets on the neighbor's house. You got to fix it. Why? Absolute liability. It's because you're the painter, okay? I actually saw a test question, really weird question, but it was made the point. Somebody decides that they want to have a pet lion. The lion goes out and attacks somebody. What is that? That's absolute. If you have a dangerous situation and they consider a swimming pool dangerous, then that's absolute. Okay. The second one is strict. Strict is products. Whether you make the product or you sell the product, that product goes out and does damage to people or whatever it's supposed to do, supposed to wash the clothes, uh, the clothes disintegrate. That's someone's liable here, right? And that is going to be strict liability. It's product liability. And then the third one is what we're talking about now, vicarious. You are responsible. Well, we don't have, well, you're responsible for your servants if you have servants, but mostly what we're talking about here is pets and children. That lion is not a pet, okay? Your dog is. Your dog goes and bites someone, it's on you. That little kid that you think is the only perfect human being God ever made, at 12 years old, goes out and chucks a rock through the neighbor's window, that's on you. It's vicarious. You're responsible for your children and your pets. No absolute, no strict, no vicarious. You're going to get points. Okay, I don't know if you're going to get three, but you're not going to lose. You should never lose points on those three things because they are very, very learnable. Here's my attitude about this test. You're going to have tough questions. 
you're going to have some questions that are really poorly written. And they do that just so no one will ever get 100 on the test. And you just do the best you can. But then you're going to have a series of questions that are so simple, you don't believe me until you take the test. You wouldn't even need it to have studied a course to get them right. They're that simple. Get a handful of those. Then you get these kind of questions, stuff that's not hard to learn. And if you studied the right stuff, it's in the bag. You get all the easy ones. You get all the ones we're telling you to learn. And then you pick up the others in the questions where the information is there that you should be able to figure out the answer. And that's an approach to the test. Let's see what happened. Siri moves into fourth place. Solomon is in fifth place. There's a person called, I think that's a C, a G and not a C, G Cole, G, whatever, forgive me. Um, 16 in a row though needs to be mentioned. That's fantastic. Next one says, we're going to move something on my way. If a person recognizes and understands that there's a danger involved in, in, in an activity and voluntarily chooses to do it anyway. That's assuming the risk. It's dangerous to jump out of an airplane. The dog on it, I'm going to do it anyways. You assume the risk when you do that, okay? Most of you could see that. Some of you were tempted by contributory negligence. Whenever you see negligence, that's damage done to someone else because you screwed up, okay? What they're asking about here is something's dangerous and you decide to do it anyways, you are now assuming the risk. Hopefully, as we've done this this afternoon, you get to see the importance of just understanding English and what these words mean. So however you can help yourself do that is going to really arm you for taking and passing the test. What happened here? Sarah, I see Sarah's name in the top five. Sue, boy, the Sues are doing well today. Sue in Arizona, Sue. Three in a row, Wendy has got three in a row. Next question says, unbroken chain of events beginning with negligence and leading to injury or damage. And the answer to that question is the proximate clause. Even if you can never figure out what approximate cause means, remember this, approximate cause is always described as an unbroken chain. So when you see the words unbroken chain, connect it to proximate cause. What it is, I use the same example every time, so maybe you'll remember, it's the fire, the firemen come out, use water, you see water damage, the proximate cause of fire. There's an unbroken chain of events. Nothing happened in between the fire and the water. So the fire is the cause. And that's called proximate cause. It's an unbroken chain. It'll be on your test. It is meant to be a point the state's just giving to you. In golf, we call it a gimme putt, okay? Proximate chain. Proximate, unbroken chain, proximate cause. You know, sometimes you got to listen to what Peter's thinking and not what he's saying, right? All right. I hope once in a while I make you smile anyway, not torture you. Solomon moved into fifth place. Tasha up four places. Congratulations to all of you doing this game. Automatically at fault for doing something dangerous. That is absolute. Remember I told you, you got to know absolute, strict, and vicarious. That That's absolute. Almost all of you got it right. So I must have either already knew 
knew it and I wasted your time or some of you it's starting to click for you. But either way, I'm happy if you know it. That's absolute. Just because you're doing it and you know you're doing it, that's absolute liability. Uh, let's see here. Looks like the leader stayed exactly the same. Arizona Susie has got eight in a row. What did we say? Litchfield Park, I think you told me. I've been there. I think my wife made me go to a home goods out there. No man wants to go to home goods. <laughs> okay. Next one says, a policy based on the max amount of money an insurer will pay in the event of a loss. Now that happens to be stated value. Allow me a couple minutes, what choice you got? You got to listen to me, you're here. I told you, you got to know replacement costs and actual cash value. They're the two money makers. You got to know those. But there are other ones you got to have some familiarity with. Market value, stated value, agreed value. Those are all, those are some of the other ones. Let me just talk about stated value. What happens in stated value, this is basically what happens. The insurance company says, this item you want insured, I don't care what you think it's worth, the most we're gonna insure that item for is this. It's a stated value. So you can say, okay, or you can say, go away insurance company. But if you take it, the insurance company stated what they would cover for, and it says in here, the amount, the maximum amount of money the insurance company will pay in the event of a loss. That is, it's based on that. That's a stated value. An agreed value is very close to stated. It's where you and the insurance company, we're not sure what to do, but you agree that it's worth this. Market value is when we value a home not on replacement cost, not on actual cash value, but what a willing buyer and willing seller would take for this house. What's it worth? on the market. Now, those three are not as common as replacement costs and actual cash value, but you could like here get a statement, a question. And it says the most amount the insurance company will pay in the event of a loss, it's a stated value. We could argue about this, but it doesn't matter. Okay, that's the way it works. Uh, stated and agreed, Lynn, uh, very commonly. Those are hard. I would just say this, agreed is when you, the insurance company, agree with the insurance company and you say, yeah, this jewelry is worth 15,000, okay? And you agree to it. Stated, it ends up being the same thing, but it comes at it different. The insurance company says, I don't care what you want. We're not covering that for any more than 15,000. And you decide to accept the policy. So Lynn's argument would be, aren't I agreeing? I understand that. I understand that. It's a very subtle difference. One is the two of you come to the number. The other one is the insurance company lays the number down and you either take it or leave it, right? That's the difference in my brain. What are we doing here in the leaderboard? Oh, a new number one. Arizona Susie um, is there. D, three in a row. What's next? The next question we're going to have is certain rules must be met by both parties. That is our conditions. There are three other words here. If you know them, great. If you don't, there's a good chance that a couple of them, I don't know which ones will be on your test. Adhesion, what does adhesion mean outside of insurance? Something that sticks, I think of Velcro, but it's something that sticks, right? So adhesion in the insurance policy says the insurance company has a price and you cannot negotiate or barter. It's take it 
or leave it. This is the price. We're not moving. That's what adhesion is. Unilateral means only one party has to keep their end of the bargain. So let's think about the two parties. The insurance company promises to pay the claim. Our client promises to pay the premium. If the insurance company doesn't pay a claim that their policy says they have to cover, they're going to get sued. They're going to be made to pay the claim. But the policyholder decides not to pay for the policy anymore. They can't be sued. Since that only one party is legally bound, we call that unilateral. Uni always mean, means one, folks. If you're riding a unicycle, as one wheel. So uni always means one party is bound to follow. Aleatory is, no one uses that word. Melissa came up with this, and I think it's wonderful. Replace that in your brain with a lottery. Because that describes what we're talking about. I don't care how much you pay for insurance. The insurance you buy is worth may, way more than what you're paying. I wouldn't pay $400 for a policy that's only going to cover me for $400. Why bother, right? I expect if I'm paying $400, i am getting a lot more of that back in the events of a claim. And you do. The insurance you buy, you never pay the full amount of the claim. You pay less. What you pay is not the same as what you're insured for. And that difference, we call it aleatory. Melissa uses the word a lottery because you put $10 down on the mega ball and win, you're going to get more than $10 back. And that might be a way to help you understand. But those three words, although they're not right for this question, are on your test. Adhesion, unilateral and aleatory have got to become part of your vocabulary. And we had a switch in the leaderboard. Sue replaced Arizona Sue for this amount of time. As I did these questions, I got to, I was giving you guys 30 seconds to answer. And then I got to these questions here. You're only getting 20 seconds to answer. So I just wanted to, if you like taking your time, I don't imagine why you'd want to do that. Oh, I didn't read the question. Read it yourself. A policy based on fair valuation for the property. Fair valuation. I don't think that's a very good question. But anyway, what do I know? The answer is market value. Well, Peter wouldn't. Oh, pardon me. The answer is agreed value. I was saying to myself, why isn't it agreed value? It is agreed value. What's agreed value is the two of you decide that's fair. That's why the word, I didn't think it was a good question because I think fair, who decides what's fair? So I, I'm not crazy about that question, but I can't assure you guys that every question you get is going to be clear. So the word fair, the only one that kind of meets that is if you and the insurance company agree on it, that has to be fair to you. Stated value, it's the insurance company just tells you what they're going to insure you for. The market value, you might think you're worth house worth 300,000, but you can only sell it for 250. So you may not think that it's fair, right? Replacement cost is what it would cost to rebuild the house brand new. Fair is agreed. Again, it's Look at folks, this isn't an insurance question. This is an English question. Which of these is the most fair settlement? What do we got? Leaderboard stayed the same. Steph has got four in a row, right? Next question. Increase the probability of a loss. What increases the probability of a loss? It's a hazard. It is actually the definition of a hazard, whether it's physical, moral, or morale, 
it increases the probability of a loss. It's the definition of a hazard. And almost all of you saw that coming, okay? A couple of you were tempted by exposure, but the, just look up. What's the definition of a peril? What's the definition of a hazard? Because understanding that and working with that, you remember when we learned words, when we were learning a language, I don't matter if it's French or English or whatever, they would say, say the word, now use it in a sentence. That's not a bad idea. Peril, cause of the loss, use it in a sentence. Uh, my house burned down, the cause, the peril was fire, right? Hazard, we insured someone who uh, was in prison for arson. <laughs> That's a moral hazard, right? Potentially dishonest person, use it in a sentence. Just Uncle Peter, I want you guys to pass the test. So everything I tell you is meant to make you successful. Next question, all leaders stayed the same. Steph had five in a row, right? Next question. What type of policy lists the perils insured against? That's named peril. I told you you got to know the difference between a named peril and an open peril. Listed peril sounds great, except there is no such thing as a listed peril. And it doesn't exist. It's a nice little temptation. Maybe we can trick the people to pick this one because it sounds so good. Specified peril, same thing. Sounds good, doesn't exist. They made it up. The difference between a named peril and an open peril. So we've come upon that more than once in our quizzes. Uh, leaderboard, we got a shift. Bree, the Susies have been deposed. Bree, Arizona Susie, Sarah, Sue, and Solomon are top five. Steph has got six in a row cooking. Next question. Individual, I gotta move something around here, or businesses, that are not named as insureds on in the declaration page, but are still protected on the policy. We call them additional insureds. Most of you got that. I just want to give you an example from policies you've studied. You know, in your homeowner's policy, they cover residents of the house. So that could be all your children who will not be named on the policy. It could be your mother-in-law if she lives with you, right? She's covered. She's not named. So we would call those people additional. She's insured. She's an additional insured because she's not named in the policy. That's what we're getting at. I want to do one more example. Do you know in your auto insurance, there are a whole bunch of people covered that are not named? In the auto policy, if you read that, it says anybody driving the car with your permission is insured. Well, I don't know about you, but the only people who drive my car without permission stole it. Anybody driving my car, I told them it was okay, and they are insured. Not named in the policy. So there's a whole bunch of people who are insured who won't be named. And we call, have a name for that. That's called additional insurance. Next one. What do we got in the change? Sarah. Sarah's up ahead of the two Sues. Bree is fourth. And Solomon fifth. D, three in a row. We're getting down near the end, folks. The injured party must be completely free of fault in order to collect. Mm. 
I'm glad this question came up. The con answer is contributory negligence and only a few of you got it right. Um, it's not assumption of risk. It's not an intervening cause, but I need to understand the difference between contributory and comparative negligence, okay? Um, it says here, you must be completely free of fault to collect. That means if you contribute in any way to the accident, you can't collect because you're not 100% free of fault. Comparative negligence is the better one. Comparative negligence, let's say you're in an accident, the police report says it was 70% the other person's fault, but you have 30% to blame. If you have contributory negligence, you're going to get zero because you had some fault. That stinks. But if you have comparative negligence, they'll say, okay, you, you are only 30% to blame. So you can collect 70% of the damages from the other person. Comparative means we compare how much you had and each side has to pay the fair share. But if you have contributory, it's hard and fast. If you contribute in any way, you get nothing. So if you have a choice in your liability coverage, you want comparative. You do not want contributory. So write those words down and make sure that they make sense to you. Leaderboard, it looks to me like it stayed the same. A whole bunch, uh, six players have got three in a row and we're coming down to the last. I'm gonna give you two more questions because of our time. This question says, policy that only pays for a loss after the primary policy has paid their limit. Primary policy first, this one second. Well, it can't be the primary policy. So anytime you're paying second, it's excess. First one pays up the limit. If there's still some due, the excess comes in. If you remember earlier, I don't expect you guys remember everything I said. I did tell you an umbrella policy is an excess policy after your base policy pays, okay? It's not a deductible. It's, it's excess is above and beyond. Then you have a secondary policy after the primary. So that, that would be excess. One more question and then a couple of tips. Sarah, Sue, Bree, Arizona, Susie, Solomon, Tasha, four in a row. Last question for today. It says, the other party's negligence or fault will not necessarily defeat the claim. That's comparative. We just talked about that. In a comparative negligence, uh, they'll pay the amount that you're the, that the, is responsible. So, if the other party's seventy percent responsible, it doesn't negate the claim. They still have to pay seventy, and you have to pay thirty. But if it were contributory, boom, it negates the claim. It's all on you, even though you are only responsible for thirty percent. That confuses you, write the words down, contributory and comparative. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed our game. Uh, we teach, in fact, I've got three classes next week if you wanna come in and learn more specifics. In the teaching, we don't play a game. I go through the material and I try to explain it and I take questions from people, we try to work it out. So at the end of the class, you leave with more light bulbs on than before. And they've been well received so far. So consider coming to that next week. Look it over, see if it meets your schedule. Uh, I hope you learned today. And, um, you know, I got to give a mixed message. I hope to see you again. But if you're going to go and pass the test, I if you're going to take the test, I hope I don't see you because you passed, if you get my message. It's been fun for me. I hope you had fun. And more importantly, whether you had fun or not, that you learned something. 
So I will see you guys later. Thanks for coming. Phoenix, taking a test Monday. Stay cool to answer the questions slowly. Okay. Saturday, Kira. Stay cool. Read the questions slowly. Slowly, slowly, slowly. B is also there. You guys go and pass, then come back and write about how great our classes were. A lot of people taking it real soon. Hey, if we help you pass it, tell the world. Come back on our website and say that. You are more than welcome. I usually stay on and don't end the class just in case someone's got a specific question. So as long as there's people in the participants list, I kind of stick around in case you got a question. You're all more than welcome. It was very much a good time for me. What was the final score? Oh, I'm sorry. That was my fault. The final score is as posted. Sarah, Sue, Bree, Arizona, Susie, and Solomon. So Arizona, Susie, fourth out of, I think, 35 people. That's pretty good. I think it's very good. You know, Phoenix, I, I've taught a couple California classes. And one thing that struck me as unusual in California, a huge portion of your test is on state law. It isn't even on insurance. It's on state law. Now, you if that's the case, if it's like 35 or 40% of your test, you got to get clear on the law because it's such a huge chunk of your test. If I remember, California was a lot about laws. So you have to look at that and see what it is. Uh, focus on the chapters that are going to ask you the most questions. You'll find a list of that somewhere in your study material. It's different for every state. And if I'm right about California, that means you're going to significant amount of your time is going to be in the law section. But just look at the chapters where they're going to ask you the most questions and make sure you're strong in those areas because they're the chapters that offer you the most points in your favor. I'll see you then, Litchfield. Was I right? Is there um, home goods up there? Arizona is the opposite of California. Very little on law. The Arizona, you can, you have to look at the front of the book. Are you just taking personal lines, Kalite, or just or property and casualty? Yeah, that's right. Probably was good. Yeah. Are you taking personal lines or property and casualty, Kalite? Both property and casualty. The biggest chapters for you is the chapter on the commercial package policy, a commercial package policy. It's the most complex policy, which is why they got the most questions. The second most are homeowners and insurance basics. We spent two hours on the basics today, but those three chapters are half your test. If you've got your study material somewhere in there, it should tell you how many questions are coming in each chapter, okay? I don't know what you're studying from, so I don't know what page you go to, but it's available to you. If you see the biggest chapters right there. For you, it's commercial package, homeowners, and basics, half your test. That I know because I'm in Arizona. Where you live in Arizona? I'm in Youngtown. Youngtown, help me out. Is that, that, is, is that south or north of Phoenix? It's, it's, it's Northwest side. I'm over here by Sun City. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yep. I've no, I don't have, I don't have any other training material other than these classes that I'm taking with you guys. Okay. I have, 
I have a, I have a large, like uh, my, uh, the lady that I interviewed with, um, she gave me like a package that's like a hundred pages long of like a bunch of uh, uh, definitions and stuff. Oh, this is the people who are hiring you? Yeah. Okay. Um, Melissa has got some courses on property casualty where they go through all the chapters if you want to go in more depth. Also, I don't know if it's going to help you, but I'm teaching three classes on property casualty next week if you want help in those areas. But yeah. uh, th that's that's what we have to offer is to kind of- I have, the, I have the gold package with you guys. Oh, then you're all set. That's what I've been told. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not. I have to get. I have to study more. I just barely got that uh, last week. Okay, that's fair. You don't pass this test without studying. That's for sure. Thank you. I will be asking you more questions, especially because you're in Arizona. Okay, I'm happy. That's what I'm here for. I'm happy to do it. Thanks, man. Yep. Bye now. Bye. Okay, you guys that are still signed in. If you don't have questions, you can go home <laughs> and then I'll shut it off. But I hate shutting the class off in case there's a question. That's why I, you, it, the class is still open. But I'm seeing 15, uh, 13 of you still signed in. So it could be that some of you people have actually left and forgot to sign out. So I'm going to give it like 30 seconds. If I don't get a question next 30 seconds, then I'm going to close and lock the door. You're welcome, bunny love. Everyone has a good knife, light. I hope so. We're going to hope you learned something. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good night. God bless everybody. Uh, come to us if we can help you. We'd love to help you.